Comp C is your home for buying, selling, and flipping all the hottest trading cards. Their consignment marketplace is home to over 29 million cards, from baseball superstars like Aaron Judge to Marvel favorites like Spider-Man. ComC has something for every type of collector. Visit ComC.com today to build your collection with your favorite cards. You're listening to the Wax Pack Hero Sports Card Minute, a podcast where we discuss both the hobby and business sides of collecting. I'm your host, Mike Summer, and I want to help you buy, sell, and trade your way into a collection you'll love. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Wax Pack Hero Sports Card Minute. I want to start today's episode by talking about a new little side project I have to boost my basketball card collection. And it's another project that's based on nostalgia and on a walk down memory lane. And it started with an article that I read in Sports Collectors Daily. I read it a while ago, and I don't remember exactly how I stumbled across it, but it was an article with former NBA player Tyrone Nesby. He played for the Clippers, he played for the Wizards. And in this article, one of the questions that was asked is, when was the first autograph that you remember signing? And in the, in the article, he talks about being in a high school slam dunk contest back in Illinois, and... After he competed in that contest, some kid came up to him and asked for his autograph. And that was the first time that he could remember ever signing for somebody. Well, I was at that slam dunk contest because that was the year and the same event that I was participating in the state three-point shooting contest. And I went up to Tyrone after he was done competing, and I asked him to sign the program that we were both in. And so I may have been the kid that he was referring to that came up to him after the slam dunk contest and asked him for his autograph for the first time. And when I read that, I was like, that is really cool. And so I went and I found the the program and yeah, I still had it with his autograph in it. And I was just that I was reminded of that this week. And I said, you know what, I should go out and see how many cards he has And I went out to Trading Card Database and looked it up, and he's got 116 cards. And through all of the the cards and the sets and things that I've got, I realized that I had, I don't know, 15 or 20 of them already. Went out to ComC, and ComC had a whole bunch listed. Looked at Sport Lots. There's several more listed on Sport Lots that were available. And I said, you know what? I think I could put together a nice little bundle of, of these cards and see how many I can find out there. And so over the course of the last several days, I've gone out to come see and made some offers and I pulled out the ones that I've got already in my collection and looked through the, the clippers and the wizard sections of my shop inventory. And I've been able to, to track down 75 of his 116 cards here already in the first week. And so a lot of the ones left are a lot of the low serial numbers that are out there. Some of the one of ones, there's some serial number to 25s that are out there that are going to be hard to find a few printing plates, but not a ton because over the course of those four seasons, he he didn't have necessarily a ton of cards produced, but I'm going to keep trying to track down more of these Tyrone Nesby cards because there's that little bit of a connection back from when I was in high school got a chance to meet him and then the reference in that interview is just kind of really cool to me and so a nostalgia driven collection of a former NBA player plus there's some cool cards there from the the late 90s that are, are going to be a part of this so that is my little side project that's going to boost my basketball card collection kind of fun tells it, it's part of my story as well and I think that's what's what's really cool anyway that is not our main topic. Our main interview guest today is Tim Shepler. Big Shep is back to, t- to catch up a little bit and talk about what it's like running a card shop here in 2022. He's do- He's been doing that full time now for the last year or so. And I just wanted to catch up with Tim and talk a little bit about what he's been been up to, how the shop is going out there in the Sacramento, California area, kind of compare notes on how things are going here in central Illinois. And so that's what we're going to do right after I tell you about Underdog Collectibles, the online shop run by collectors for collectors that breaks almost seven days a week now across YouTube, Facebook, and Loop. 
You can see what they're going to be breaking this week by checking them out at udogcollect.com, or you can visit their brick and mortar shop in Knoxville, Tennessee, to see their full selection of wax, singles, supplies, and about everything else that you would want to get. Check them out at udogcollect.com, and when you do, tell them Wax Pack Hero sent you. I want to welcome Tim Shepler back to the show. We last talked sometime last spring. I don't remember the exact date, but I wanted to bring Tim back on to catch up and see how things have been going. So, Tim, welcome back to the show. Mike, thank you. It's a, it's a pleasure to be back on. I think this is the third time now. Uh, third time's a charm. I, it's always fun to hang out and, and talk with you, so I appreciate it. Yeah, it's, it's always good to, to chat and to catch up. You know, when we talked last, you had, had not too long before that, started a venture of of doing cards full time and, and working um helping lead a a card shop and I wanted to catch up first of all just to see how that's been going for you over the course of 2022. Uh it's been wild, so crazy. So we we opened up uh True Sports Cards and Collectibles in November of 21, actually the Saturday following Black Friday. So we're coming up uh, on a year and uh it's been a, been a heck of a ride uh being able to be in a shop every day uh, and, and just trying to see how that life is. And, you know, everybody sees all the glitz and glamour, like, Oh man, you work in a shop. You get to do this. You get to watch sports, talk sports all day. And hey, I can tell you, that's awesome. 15% of, of the job. The other spot is, is sourcing product like uh, wax and supplies. Supplies were so hard when we first opened up the shop to, to locate. It's a little easier now. Um, you know, doing purchases, that's all fun. But then now once you have, these mass purchases going through and getting them organized and priced and out on the floor as quick as possible. Uh, you know, setting up the eBay store and getting those listings out there and making sure you're competitive in all your pricing and uh, one that you're not overpriced or two, too underpriced where, you know, you can, you know, you lose a, you lose a little bit of profitability there, but it's been a fun ride. We've, we've had uh, five autograph signers through our shop. Uh, the first few months we were open I know we're going to talk about later, but we have a giant show come out up here in November to celebrate our one-year anniversary. But, like, I've got to sit down and have dinner with Raleigh Fingers and do an autograph signing with him. Uh, Rick Barry, uh, we've had a Horace Grant, and it was, you know, we got to talk about Horace about Last Dance and some of his thoughts. That was cool. We had Vita Blue and Alex English um, in the shop. And just to be able to sit down and talk to these guys about their careers uh, and get to see the customers interact with them, their fans, and just how normal these guys actually are and uh, how much they actually enjoy doing autograph signings. And the fact that, you know, the, the people go, oh, hey, they still remember who I am. Uh, it's to me, it's like, duh. But to them, it's it's really cool to see that and to, to hear their stories. So like Raleigh keeps some whatever he has left of his like Cy Youngs and stuff. And world there, he's like, they're out in the garage somewhere. I don't know. You want them? <laughs> Legitimately what he said. You want them? So that's funny. Um, yeah, it's been it's been awesome. It's been a lot of fun. You know that so much has changed within the shop. I would think over over this last year, right from from the fall of twenty one to where we're at now, um, wax you know isn't uh, a, up and to the right for for all products anymore like it was. Um, even like what you had mentioned, buying a collection and getting it out for sale as soon as possible it, over this last you know, six months or so seems more and more important as well. Right. I mean, there's a period of time there where you buy a collection, even if you don't get it out priced and for sale right away, that's fine. Cause most likely the stuff inside was going to be worth more three months later than it was, you know, when you bought it, we're not necessarily seeing that same thing come into play so much. So how has that gone from, from you get from you guys' perspective, as you think about, the focus of, of getting things out, the, the consideration that you're taking when you, when you're buying a collection about how quickly can we turn this versus are we okay holding this and selling it over time? You know, how are you guys approaching those types of, of concepts based on where we're at today in the market? Yeah. The big thing is when we started the store, we knew we were never going to be cheapest in wax and we never want to build our stealth uh, as a wax based store. The reason being, there's a lo- another sh- a shop here uh, locally that is, pretty much strictly wax and he's been doing it for almost 25 maybe 30 years now so his allocation and his sources are a lot different and a lot deeper than what we have starting out brand new so he's always gonna have the best prices on wax we're always gonna lose there and we knew that so we're fine with that um we wanted to win on singles we probably have close to a million singles in our hot corner and it's actually hot corners it's the two back corners of the store 
uh, full from dollar boxes up to, to graded cards. So I would say dollar to like $60 cards are out on the floor for people to grab a box and dig through. So when we buy these large collections, when, when, when someone comes in to sell us stuff, we're not going to, uh, we don't want to cherry pick and go, Hey, we're going to take your Nolan Ryan rookie. We're going to take your second year Johnny bench, uh, your, your second year Jordan Fleer card. And we're going to make you leave with everything else. If you want to sell all of this stuff to us, we're going to make a play. We're going to buy it all from you. Um, or if there's a piece you want to keep after we talk and then you want to sell the rest, we'll do that. But here's what we're willing to do. We're willing to take it all in and then we'll dig through it and find out whatever is in there. And that's been a really big bright spot for us because people then the trust factors there a little bit more that we're just not going to let, you know, we're not going to take all the steak and make them take home the bologna. We'll, we'll take it all too. Um, and when we do that, we take in a big collection. Our thing is, hey, what are the biggest pieces that, that are going to make us mo the most money back? So say we spend a thousand dollars on a purchase. Well, how can we recoup that? most of that money in the fastest amount of way, what cards are going to do that? Let's pull those out. Let's get them into the shop. Whenever we take stuff in, I, as the general manager of the store, I tell my guys, we got to give it at least a week or two in the shop. So a good amount of our customers have first opportunity to buy it. Then we can put it on the eBay page. Um, and then, you know, we'll be able to sell it there. And if someone comes in and says, Hey, do you have that Nick Claxton one of one black nebula that I saw that you guys had? It's not here anymore. Oh yeah, guess what? It's it's in our eBay store, but I can go grab it. Here's the price. They can buy it from us direct and we close the order there or the listing on eBay. Uh, so that's what we do. And then we take the rest of it, the bulk stuff. And then we, we sit down and I legitimately have old four row boxes that have dollar, $3, $5, $10, $15, all the way up to $20. And my guys then sort, okay, they just take a stack and they go, okay, where's this go? Where are we going to put this out? So we do it quickly. Now we don't sit and comp every card which we look back and make sure, hey, is this a numbered parallel? Because I can tell you Mosaic and Prism and a lot of the stuff from Panini that's sneakily numbered on the back because the colors all kind of look the same. We try to flip it over. Hey, is it numbered? And then we have a box that just says comp later. And we will sit and we'll have somebody, once that's kind of full, about four or 500 cards, we'll sit and go through and, and comp it out. Um, but that's kind of how we break it down. And we try to do it quickly and get it out onto the floor. Uh, we even have a couple of what I call interns uh, we have this kid, Silas, that's uh, 14, and we have another kid, Will, who's 15. The customer is a shop. Uh, they, we give them store credit for the hours they put in. They come in, they help us do a lot of that stuff and get it out onto the floor so we can get it out quicker and faster. Plus, they have a great time doing it. And so it just really is like, let's get, the, let's get the big parts out, put that out, make some money up, and then the rest will just kind of feed on for the next few months. You know, you mentioned with with being more of a singles focused shop, not going into the shop with a with a mindset that you're going to be a, a a wax focused shop. How important has it been for you to have cards at all price levels? Right. We oh. we hear so often that you know people going to shows, people going to trade nights, people doing these things, and the big cards are the the focus of of what people you know talk about all the time. But when it comes to actually running a shop that is is doing well, how important has it been to have cards at all price levels? Oh, it's huge. I mean, it really is. I mean, we have so many people. We have a, a, a retired professor that drives about three hours down to our shop and three hours home. So six hour round trip. And he'll come and he comes probably once a month and he'll sit and dig through the dollar and the $3 boxes all day long. And, uh, you know, he goes through and, and loads them up and uh, loves digging through the prices. And then I have customers that come in and, and they want only graded cards. So they go to those boxes. So it's really important to kind of have a wide spectrum. So you can, you can hit, it's kind of like a sprinkler. You're going to hit more customers, the wider the range is. And I knew this setting up here at local shows in Sacramento, when I was a dealer on my own, I was, I looked around and everybody had show, before I was a dealer for a couple of years, I would go, everybody had wax and showcase items didn't have anything else so i'm like well how i'm not that guy i'm not that collector so how can i take stuff that i have and make it work well i was the quarter box dollar box and three dollar box guy and i had one small showcase of stuff and i had people constantly at my tables so when we opened the shop i just took that and we just kind of moved it up to a baseline of a dollar and, and three dollars and, and five dollars and so on and our pricing is very simple legitimately we have dollar three dollar and then our prices mark boxes are five ten fifteen twenty and then twenty five are on up but we don't have like weird twelve dollar eight dollar prices if it's an eight dollar card we're going to put it at five bucks if we look at it, it's eleven dollar card it's going to be a ten dollar card 
You know, if it's a $14 card, it might get priced at 15, but more likely it's going to be priced at 10. And the reason being is we want that card to come in and we want to, we, cause we bought it for less than that already. When we buy, you know, we buy so much in bulk, the card price comes down and we want to pass that on to our customers. There's people that pulled out. We had a, uh, we, Sam Ellinger just got named starter, right? For the Colts rookie autos for five or 10 bucks. And somebody came in Monday morning and started digging through our prices, mark boxes and about five or six for under $10. Now they're going for 50 or 60. Me being a Colts fan, he's a $10 auto. I'm telling you, he's, mm-hmm. he's not the, he's not the game changer that he is, but Hey, for right now, people are overpaying for him. And if this guy can come up on it, we made money on the card. He's going to make a whole lot money, more money on the card, but guess what he's going to do. The next time somebody gets named a starter, that's not, that's not a big name. Uh, say Jacob Easton that sometimes comes to start. Like he's going to come back and dig through those boxes and do that all over again. Uh, so it just kind of helps customers understand like, Hey, there is values in these boxes and I should dig through them and, and see what's there. Yeah. It's been super helpful for me as well. You know, there's so much worrying and hand wringing and things over the the price of some of these big cards coming down. And, and I'm just sitting back at the shop and sport lots and everything else where I'm selling my quarter to $5 type cards and, Every weekend, people keep coming in and people keep filling up boxes of, of these low end cards. And I don't have to worry about the the rise and the fall of, of all of these things because, you know, I'm into these cards for pennies, right? And selling them for quarters to dollars that I, I don't have to have that stress level of, oh, I, I can't, I can't buy that because I'm worried that in two weeks, it's going to be worth a thousand dollars less than it, than it is today. So having those, having that complement of, of cards at all price levels uh, has been super helpful for me. Oh yeah. And I can tell you, we have, so we end up with all these great baseball singles that come through, but that are sport lots cards. Uh, I have a customer, his name is Jay and he has a humongous sports lot store. I think close rivaling you. And I mentioned your name and he's familiar with who you are. And uh, he comes in and I sell him five rows of common baseball from 2010 to newer. And I load up a five row, a 5,000 count box full of singles. And we, he buys them by the box. And, uh, you know, most of the time it's commons. There'll be some rookies and stuff in there, but nothing killer. But he buys them up, lists them on sport lots, and he loves doing it. And he's like, hey, I'm buying them for pennies for you. I'm selling them for quarters on sport lots. Everyone's happy. We all we all get in, we all make a little bit of money and have a good time doing it. So it's it's an, it's neat. I mean, we I saw this guy that uh, I get we call him quote a friend of the shop. Uh, he might have been been involved at the shop at one point in time or no longer is, but really heavily put money into Calvin Ridley. Calvin Ridley gets hurt. Not a bad thing. He has mental things, and we all have been there. Trust me, I've done that. You no, know, been there. But then he goes out and he bets on his own team. He's suspended for a year. So what happens to Calvin Ridley? poof his prices go down everybody forgets who he is he's no longer a factor but now oh god i got the most expensive calvin ridley cards ever because i was making a play and guess what he's gone and done for and forgotten about and uh for me i I look back and go this is why you don't speculate on uh all these players i I get a lot of guys we talk about ups and downs the market you know they rattling off 10 12 rookies from this last basketball class with cade and and uh and the Jalen's as I like to call them and Mobley. And I'm like, yeah, I said, awesome. You can name 12 guys. It's a deep, it's a wide class, but how many superstars are in there? Maybe two, maybe three if you're lucky, but all these guys aren't gonna pan out. Just look back a few years when you guys were talking up other guys and you were talking up Marvin Bagley Jr. here, or, or the third one Sacramento. We're very familiar with them, and a bunch of the other players. And then their careers didn't pan out, so now you moved on. But you you think that every year there's going to be 10 rookies that are worth collecting. It doesn't happen that way. I'm telling you, you want a stable market, the retired guys. That's where you need to be, uh, vintage guys. You can speculate, get a big rookie, flip it as quick as you can uh, when the market's right. You know, Right now, don't buy Bailey Zappi. Sell Bailey Zappi if you have him today. Sell him. Sell him now because look at Mac Jones. I was telling everybody. Mac Jones, the best we ever can see of Mac Jones was he was going to be Kirk Cousins, Alex Smith at the very best. And now Bailey Zappi is beating him out. I don't know. You tell me. So, What has traffic in the shop been like for you guys? I'd say for me here in central Illinois, over the last several months, the traffic has been down. The volume of customers coming through has been down. Even at our small monthly show, you know, there's more shows going on. So um, there's a little more competition for for eyeballs. Traffic has been down, but I would say my sales 
have been pretty steady or or even up a little bit. And so the people who are continuing to come in are still actively buying cards. They're still buying stuff. You know, I've I've heard from some others who have been at shows recently that there was a decent amount of people there, but it seemed like more people were just there browsing, not necessarily buying or spending any money. Like I said, for me, I'd say that I've seen fewer people, but the people that are coming are still buying. What have you guys been seeing out there in California? Yeah, we're here in Sacramento, just outside in the suburbs. But I would say that it's very, the the sales have been very consistent. It's just the, like you said, the traffic, the foot, the people, the actual physical people walking in the door during the week. And, and I count during the week, Monday through Thursday. Uh, I can't account Friday as a weekend here, just the, how busy we are with traffic. And Saturdays have been like insane booming. Um, but yeah, the we'll always have like Monday or Tuesday in the shop stinks. One of those two days, and I can't put my finger on which one it's going to be week to week, but one of those two days will be an awful day. It'll be our worst day of the week. Uh, we'll still do okay, um, but the other day will just be fine. And, and I can tell you that it's it's interesting to see that even though the traffic numbers are down, the sales numbers are staying have plateaued a little bit, but they're consistent and they're still consistently decent enough for us to feel good about what we're doing. And then we'll see a giant spike on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Um, and I can also tell you that now that it's getting darker earlier, it, we see a little bit less traffic after the sun kind of goes down, uh, even though it's only like 6.30. Uh, the, that little time frame there, just I think it's throwing people off again, too, as we get used to that being you know, darker earlier. And, uh, but I can say that people are still spending money. I think they're spending more wisely. You talk about these shows and a lot of these big shows, like there was one in Del Mar. There was one recently in Vegas. I know there was the Mon uh, Midway Monster, I think they call it. And people said, hey, they had mixed reviews on this. I heard a lot of people say Vegas stunk uh, as an overall thing. But I think when you have these big destination shows, the same people are traveling to these destination shows, the same dealers, the same big buyers. So my thing is like going to all the same shows together changes it's just the same inventory rotating around the same guys you're not having a like vegas there's so much more to do in vegas than go to a card show there's so much more different activities and stuff to go spend your money on del mar is is so expensive i lived in san diego for a while del mar is as ritzy as it gets in that part of southern california as far as places to stay and if you stay in san diego it's cheaper then you have to rent a car and drive half an hour to get up there so to me it doesn't make sense for them to put a show in such an expensive part of town where San Diego, there's a lot of places to host a show, a lot more hotels, a lot less expensive just to move it down the road half an hour, unless it's kind of a vanity thing. Hey, look, we're in, you know, we're in Del Mar. I, I don't understand that. You know, we're putting on, like I said, we're putting on a show here, but it's more of a local show with a, uh, a little bit of a lift to it. But I think that when you have the same dealers and you have the same buyers, it gets really doled out really fast. And you can only have some of these big destination shows a year before people are like, why, why am I going to this? Why, why do I need to go back? Uh, I've been to the Dallas show. I, I, you know, I went to the Midway monster. I, I you know, I've been to San Chantilly show. Why do I need to go to Vegas for, you know, I just think uh, it's weird. Burbank has a big show and I heard that was well received and I'm glad I'm excited for those guys, but their next one is the weekend of the Super Bowl. So I'm confused on, I'm confused on that. Like, is it bad planning? They didn't look ahead, or is it a strategic thing that hey, you're going to come down to a card show, get excited, and then go to the Super Bowl? I go back to the hotel and watch the Super Bowl. I don't, I don't know. So that to me is a little strange timing on their part, but we'll see what happens. Tell me a little bit more about the show that you guys are putting on here to celebrate the anniversary of the shop. Yeah, so True Sports Cards and Collectibles, we're putting on a show called the Sacramento Autograph Sports Card Expo. Uh, it's Friday, November 18th and 19th. We're doing a day and a half show it's a half day preview on friday uh friday we're providing we have ticket sales for both days there's vip tickets you can get for 25 bucks online or ten dollars and twenty dollars friday saturday but um friday we're gonna have three free autographs Link, the former oakland raider lincoln kennedy who's the voice of the las vegas raiders now he's the their their color guy we have dan buns uh 49ers linebacker that made the stop in the super bowl against the Bengals and helped them win that and we're also having City Royal legend, Willie Wilson. Everybody here is promoting him as an Oakland A, but I was like, no, no, no. He's a, and you probably promote him as a, as a Chicago Cub, but Royal legend, Willie Wilson on Friday. We're also having Rudy Rudinger, the actual Rudy 
the guy, the motivational speaker, the guy that was that made the play, uh, the movie was based on, and all that stuff. Rudy's going to be in Friday. Saturday, we have three guys. We have uh, the original Sacramento King from the 1985 team, LaSalle Thompson, and former 49er cornerback uh, Eric Wright, who played with Ronnie Lott and was on those Super Bowl teams in the 80s. We have guys like Jose Canseco, Miguel Tejada is coming out doing his first big signing in, in California in quite some time. We have Dan Issel, Artis Gilmore uh, coming out. We also have Jack Clark. We're going to have Tom Rathman and, and John Taylor. We have some wrestlers coming out. We have Rikishi, uh, the Godfather. Uh, let's see. We're going to have Greg the Hammer Valentine, Victoria, and my all-time favorite, because not because he was a wrestler, because he was a freaking G.I. Joe. Sergeant Slaughter is going to be out there. And then the rookie of the year uh, and, and Kevin from American Pie, uh, Thomas Ian Nichols will be there. Uh, he played Henry Rowan Gardner uh, in that great movie in the nineties. And then also iconic is I, when I was growing up, American Pie like spoke to me. I was that age when that movie came out, uh, he's going to be there. So it, we're going to have, I think almost 20 signers over two days, 60 plus dealer tables. We're going to have JSA on site doing authentications for all the autographs being done as well as people coming in and bringing their own items. They can get those authenticated uh, at the show as well. So it's going to be a lot of fun. started out as like, hey, we have a local show here that's every 90 days or so, and it's great. A lot of good dealers and stuff, but that's really it. And we're like, well, we have all these connections with autographs, you know, guys that want to come and sign. Why don't we put the two together? And we're like, hey, we'll do five or six autograph guests. Well, Then we started getting guys locked in, and then other guys started calling. So we locked Rikishi in, and then Greg the Hammer. And Jimmy Hart actually called the store and said, hey, this is Jimmy Hart. And we were like, and the guy, my kid answered the phone, didn't know who the hell Jimmy Hart was because he's 18 years old. I'm like, dude, Jimmy Hart? Um, And then we signed Tejada, and then then Jose Canseco calls and says, hey, I heard Miggy signing. I want to come. And we talked to John Taylor, and he's like, hey, I think I can get Rathman and Eric Wright to come and sign. So it's just it's just snowballed into this thing. And I, I finally talked to Emron, who's the shop owner, and I'm like, man, we got to stop because we're out of space. We have like a five uh, five thousand square foot venue that we've already outgrown, uh, and I don't know how physically we're going to make it work, but we're we're making it work, and we're working on it every day, and it's going to be a lot of fun and uh, exciting. And we have a website, uh, SacSportsCardExpo.com. You can see all the signers. We're doing we're taking mail-ins. Uh, the tickets, everything are available on there. And so we're, we're helping everybody out. So it's going to be a lot of fun. I'm excited. Um, and I just kind of want to, you know, I don't want, the only thing is I don't want Rikishi to sit on me. I mean, that's <laughs> the one thing I'm afraid of that I'm going to upset him. He's going to sit on me, but I do want to say what's up to Sergeant Slaughter. Cause I had a warthog as a kid, but my favorite GI Joe toy and he's going to be there. I still wish I had it. Cause that would definitely be autographed. Give us the dates and times one more time for the show. Yeah. It's going to be Friday, uh, November 18th and Saturday, November 19th. And then Friday it's going to be three to seven. Saturday all day, nine to six. Very cool. Event center. So it's going to be a lot of fun. Very cool. Well, Hey, I'm, I'm glad things have been going well for you. And sounds like this show is, is got a lot of good things going for it too. I hope it goes well. Anybody out there in the Sacramento area, make sure you, you check it out. sounds good. Anything else you want to let us know about today before, before we go of, of things that you've got going on or, or any other questions that you've got for me? No, I just, I just want to say it like, guys, everybody's listening. Keep listening to Mike. Mike does a great job. I remember when he started out and uh, one of my favorite podcasts to listen to, one of my favorite guys in the hobby. And I love the, the self-sustaining hobby. And if you guys aren't, aren't following Mike on this, I think the two of us have been the ones that allowed us about this over the last few years. Uh, it's great. Um, you know, I, I think that you do a wonderful job and I, you know, I really hope to keep it up and, and keep supporting Mike and what he does here on the show. I think it's, it's amazing. And I'm just proud of you, Mike, when we talked to you, you, you know, when you started doing the podcast, you started the, you know, doing your shop, uh, sport, lots of things, all these great things and, and really what you put in and it's paying off. So I just want to say how much we all appreciate you and, and to keep going for it. And I appreciate you having me on for a third time. And uh, when I get back on the podcast scene, I'm going to bring you on. We'll have a good time and we'll, we'll talk more cards. Sounds good. I, I appreciate you saying that. And I appreciate you coming back on today, Tim. So thanks again. Thanks Mike. Like the athletes we admire, the sports card shop is changing the game. We're not launching threes, bombing drives, or hitting dingers, but we have built a unique gathering spot for all collectors to trade cards, talk sports, play games, and watch their favorite athletes on the big screens. 
Yes, we've partnered with Panini, Upper Deck, Leaf, Tops, Fanatics, Pokemon, and others to bring you all the latest in sealed wax and singles. But the sports card shop in New Buffalo, Michigan is much, much more. Our recent expansion brings collectible sneakers, Hot Wheels, and more sports and entertainment memorabilia into the mix. Our new Collector's Cave Game Room is the perfect place to throw a rip party, bring friends, rip packs, trade cards, play billiards, ping pong, shuffleboard, classic arcade, and Xbox games, all while watching your favorite sport on TV. Visit us at thesportscardshop.com. Follow us on social at underscore sports card shop or better yet, visit us in person to learn about special events, party packages, new products and everything we're doing for you. The Sports Card Shop, connecting people, sports and the hobby around the world. It was great to catch up with Tim and it was great to hear that the hobby is alive and well out in California as well. Yes, we might have pulled back some from the craziness that we saw over the last couple years, but we are in a place now where the number of collectors and even the overall values of the cards that we're collecting are still higher than they were before we started this recent run-up, and that is a good thing, and I think that bodes well for the future. We don't know what's going to happen over the next couple years, but we do know there's still going to be a base of collectors who are passionate about their favorite teams, their favorite players, their favorite non-sports characters, and they're going to continue to want to go out and track them down and go out and chase them. And so me as a collector and me as a dealer, it's going to be my job to find a wide variety of cards that I can get into the hands of other collectors. So whether that's selling, whether that's trading, I'm going to have a lot of fun trying to get new cards into the hands of other collectors. Well, I hope you enjoyed hearing that conversation. If you did, let me know. If you didn't, let me know. Reach out to me on Twitter at TheMikeSummer. Reach out to me via email at WaxPackHero at gmail.com. Or you can track me down on Instagram or TikTok at WaxPackHero. I'd love to hear any feedback that you've got. And if you enjoy the show, tell a friend. Help us continue to grow the show by telling other collectors about it and what they might enjoy about it. I'd really appreciate that. It'd be a big help. That is all I've got for you today, so I'll catch you next time.